everybody. Hope you're doing marvelously well. Sitting here with the rather wonderful Ron Wasserman. Hello. <laughs> now, Ron, you are a TV composer. Mm -hmm. You've done film as well. Yep. We're just talking about video games as well, which is pretty awesome. Yes. I, we went to Game Sound Con the other day, and I, I feel like it's one area that musicians and composers and producers really don't understand because there is a lot, a lot of potential in that world. A lot of potential, and it's a massive amount of work. So uh, this one game I'm working on would uh, be called The Next World. We started on about five years ago. It's one guy doing it. Now he's hired a team. Genius programmer. Just like crazy. He's been programming. He quit school. He's been programming since he was 12, making a living at it. Incredible. And his, this game's amazing. So that will definitely be out next year or I'll kill him. So, <laughs> But I've done about maybe uh, 13 hours of score for it so far and have the trailers to do in maybe another four or five hours. Is that something that's continually updating as well? As they update the game, they'll come back to you and say, hey, can you score this, score that? Need more. I need more. Now we're doing this. Need more. But I love it. That's amazing. And it's fun. It's all cyberpunk stuff. Oh, fantastic. So it's dark. It's the composer's dream. You're doing these dark, gritty beats. And, of course, you can repeat stuff, and the pieces need to be 10, 20 minutes long sometimes. And then you do a lot of ethereal stuff. So you're messing with all sorts of plugins and effects just to... Mix right. it up and make the pads sound interesting, let's say. And That's lots incredible. of drones. It's fun. It's great. You've done a huge amount of stuff. You've been an artist. You've been a composer. How did you get there? I was adopted. And there was something in my DNA that my mom would tell me about even before I could do anything. I would have slept with records, not stuffed animals, which I never really believed until I found a picture of myself with my cousins and I'm holding a 45. So that part was true. And at three, my dad bought this, but we were poor, but he got this old upright piano and I just played that thing to death. At five, I started writing, taking music lessons and wrote something that went into finger exercise books. So I was officially published at five and a half. Amazing. And then... Um, I'm going to want to know what that is later so I can get my piano playing better. It's got to be <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> I don't even think I can play it anymore. So I did that and then my uncle... God bless him, bought me a piano when I was six, and I just only played piano. And I did well at school because my mom was kind of very focused on education and doing everything, so I skipped grades and went to school. And then in junior high, kind of, I was in one band. I was in the orchestra in junior high. And a great conductor, a guy named Tommy Johnson, who played the tuba on Jaws, played, did with John Williams and Henry Mancini. Incredible. Super cool guy. All the music teachers I'd had prior to that all asked me to leave because they would play what I needed to learn. I would record it, but I'd memorize it immediately. I'd never read the music, and I would do my own version, which pissed them off. So they would say, either you're going to do it my way or leave, and I left. <laughs> and that went all the way through every music class I ever took, including I uh, tried some in college and they asked me to leave. It's interesting. I almost feel like by them stifling your creativity, you're pro probably actually encouraging it. It would kind been, of F you. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it would have been great. There could have been somebody who said, all right, screw this. Yeah. Write something. Let's work on it yeah. and develop that. But none of them were writers. So that's fine. Um, so it's not a badge of honor. It's a bit of an embarrassment, but at the same time, it's just what the story was. So I had no connections into the music business and never even dreamed about going into it. I thought I'd go into photography. It's like the only thing I thought I could do. You know, I was a high school photographer, which was great, and had keys to the school because I was the photographer and I was on sound crew. So I cut high school. I never really went, but all the teachers knew where I was. This is the, don't do this. Don't do what I did. <laughs> I'd spend all day in the auditorium playing piano. And then every four or five weeks, I'd go to class. They'd hand me a test. I'd pass. And I'd go back and just play piano. So that's all I did through high school. Then I got accepted to Cal Arts on uh, photography on my portfolio. And after a year there and running out of money, I realized I sucked compared to the real photographers that were there. And they said, all you really do is sit in the ballet studio and play piano all day. Why don't you go into that? I'm like, I, I don't know how to get into this. How do you make money playing piano? Yes. I don't know anybody. I mean, what, yeah, what do you do? I knew nothing about the business. So then I decided I'll start joining bands. 
So there was a newspaper called The Recycler. I remember it well when I moved to. And I would say, looking for a keyboard player. And I just started joining every little band that I could while having horrible temporary day jobs. And kept focusing on that and then got it into another band. And we were almost signed. But the guy who ran the business, which later on would work at a company called Saban, kind of blew those deals for us. And then one day... This gal, E.G. Daly, uh, came up to me and said, hey, I'm signed to A&M. Do you want to be MD and keyboard player for the band? And I went, yeah. So I did that. One night in 1989, I got called into this company, Saban, to engineer and mix for a composer. I said, I don't know anything about this, but I certainly know how to run a console and I'll record all this. And I went in, and and now I'm in like $60,000 credit card debt. I mean, I'm broke. So I sat with this guy, and for the first seven hours, all he did was get high. And then he worked one hour, did three cues, made 450 bucks. And I said, I need to learn about this business. (laughs) So I just never left. All their downtime, I would spend all night there and just work on stuff. And then they hired me in to engineer and mix And then I just kept giving stuff to the producers. And luckily, a couple of them were kind enough to say, you have to break the songwriting format, you know, the chorus, I mean, verse chorus, you know, the standard thing. And finally, I started getting maybe a few little cues and a couple of direct-to-home video shows. And then in 92, they came in with X-Men, and that was the first theme that I... The guy there I knew was involved with it, but that was the first big theme. And then all of a sudden, I was scoring that and being handed other stuff. And then in came, a year later, came Power Rangers, which was a theme. They said, we need a theme for this show. And I wanted to work on another song that I was doing with my uh, then wife in a band called Fisher. So I banged that theme out in two and a half hours. Wow. And the next day they called and they said, Fox loves it. And I said, who are we going to get to sing it? I've never even sung on anything. And they said, no, you're the singer now. I said, all right. And it was just like, great, good for you guys. I'm glad it's going. I'll move on to the next project, whatever it was that night. (laughs) And then I was suddenly the hottest thing, unbeknownst to the world, but in children's television. And then uh, after three more years there, I left. Did not know what I was going to do at all. And then I got called by a guy named Bob Ezrin who produced. The great Bob Ezrin. The The great Bob Ezrin, The The Wall. wall. Yeah. And uh, he said, I have a gaming company. Want to come over and write for the games? So I said, great. So I learned about how to make these teeny tiny little MIDI files for general MIDI and old PCs. Mm -hmm. So you had this terrible selection palette of sounds. And I scored all that, and I did Ace Ventura and two Monty Python titles. And then, unfortunately, the company went belly up. At the same time, I was doing a lot of commercials, luckily. The band with my wife, uh, mp3.com, came out. MP3s had just started. I uploaded a couple of our songs that we did. Coincidentally, let me go back for a second. The song I was working on the night of the Power Ranger thing was a song called Breakable that I wanted to work on for her. And that ended up being in a film called Great Expectations. So that was, we knew we had a huge following after that, back when soundtrack albums were a big thing. We became the biggest thing online within three, four weeks. I remember the first day there was like five downloads. I'm like, wow. And then there was 3,000. Then there was 8,000. Then there was 35,000 a day. And so we shot up the charts, still could not get a record deal was building an audience, um, and then CNN called and said, we'd like to do a come by and talk to you guys, and Time Magazine came by. And then the record companies popped in and said, uh, we're ready to do a deal with you. But I was in the driver's seat, so I negotiated with them for all the years that they were kind of brutal with me. I was never mean. I just had a few demands I wanted. And finally... um, Ended up on a deal, it's Farm Club Records, but it was actually with Jimmy Iovine. It was all through uh, through Interscope. So it was great. That was a great adventure. The whole time we're killing it on commercials when we're not touring, uh, my uh, ex and I. And I'm still writing for companies like Deke Entertainment and other things, just doing animation. 
So really between... You're working a lot, basically. A lot. A lot. And it kept up with the commercials, more animation projects. It just kept going. And then I got, luckily, and I did a lot on SpongeBob SquarePants when they needed specialized stuff. And then I got a show called The Thundermans for Nickelodeon. When that wrapped in, uh, I think we mixed the last one in June of 2018, then I decided I, I need to take a little break here. Yeah, I can relax. But I was kind of burned out a little bit. So I took a little break and then things happened and then COVID came and then that really, I, I, I was going to have two NBC pilots to do when COVID hit and then they got canceled. And then I just wrote for libraries. Always just keep writing, writing, writing. And then um, COVID let up and the phone started ringing and I'm back to not crazy hours, but it's very comfortable now. Do you work entirely on your own? Do you have an assistant? 100% on my own. Never had an agent or an assistant. Incredible. Yeah. Nobody's ever actually seen me score. My son, a few times, he'll walk in. Now I want to make you Oh, that's do interesting. Something. And he'll, he'll go away. <laughs> He's like, that's fun. What are you working on at the moment? For a library company that, that uh, has a subscription service for YouTubers and everybody else, and they have pretty high quality stuff. Well, obviously, if you're writing the music. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> and uh, so a guy I know that I've done a lot of animation for, he bought this company and they want to replace everything that's there with all new material that they'll own. So I've been working on that. I have a... Um, a couple of projects I can't discuss, one for Nickelodeon, another one, uh, a couple other companies, still working on the video game, finished up a film about six weeks ago of romantic comedy, which was a trip because I've never really watched a romantic comedy. <laughs> you know, if some girl said, oh, let's watch this. Okay, I fall asleep. Just haven't really watched them. That was a blast. So that'll come out next year and the big video game will come out. They had a smaller video game with the same guy called New Terra, which is more like a handheld play game, not really Xbox 360 like this big one will be. And uh, yeah, that was fun too. So, I mean, there's always work. It's just great. And it's always diverse. When I was doing these sitcoms between 2010 and 2015, it would be acoustic based stuff. Then I did a, uh, series with Cedric the Entertainer, so I had to write a lot of gospel and R&B stuff, and that was really fun. Yeah, that sounds like a lot of fun. But you also did Hot in Cleveland. Yeah, Hot in Cleveland, got to work with Betty White. And uh, yeah. And show her how to play drums. Show, showed her how to play drums. And that she was as amazing uh, as her public persona, just the friendliest, kindest person in the world, super emotional, always not always, but a lot of times you come on the set and there's like a small tiger that somebody's brought to visit her. I mean, she was just an animal person. Mm. And I think she primarily funded the LA Zoo. Yeah, she never, uh, from what I heard, she never took a dime for 10, 10 years of her career. She just donated it all to animal causes. She didn't need it, I guess. But she was wonderful. And teaching her to play drums was hysterical. Because she starts off, I said, okay, let's do this. She's like, I, I don't think I like that. So she made it her own. It was so fun. So working with her and the other gals on the show, and the score was all over the place. It's been great. I'm lucky I never got pigeonholed into anything, and every day can be new. So the styles run the gamut. Incredible. So this is your workspace. Yeah, which is uh, not what people ever expect to see. They expect to see rows of keyboards and a million cables. And I'm kind of OCD. So I like having this setup. I just picked up the uh, top of the line Mac Studio, which is a monster. So well worth having. So I'm back to scoring in Pro Tools. I had to do a lot of the work in Ableton Live because Pro Tools is kind of clunky with virtual instruments. For people out there who understand this Omnisphere, which is a pig of a synth, but it's the best. So on the previous system in Pro Tools, I could run two of them, and the CPU errors come up. So when I got this, I loaded up 285 of them, all playing, 
and it was at like 23% CPU shares. Crazy. And that's with the new Mac? Yeah. yeah. The new M1 it, it, Studio? It's scary how powerful this thing is. And I have uh, eight terabyte of flash storage in it. So everything's internal now. It's kind of perfect. I don't even need to run external drives anymore. So it's fast. Everything loads quick because I have three or 400,000 sounds to pick from. So now I can just fly through them all. It's nice. great. Because, you know, you got to find that one thing. You're like, that drum kit's great. This one's better. I'm getting there. You know, it's great. The selection now so different from the days of doing that early Saban stuff where I think I had two drum kits and maybe two bass sounds that were somewhat authentic sounding. <laughs> were you hiring a lot of musicians in those days to replay stuff or were you? I had a couple guys come in now and then to do some of the lead guitar stuff. The rest was all done on keyboard. But once they said, okay, you can have $75 to hire a guitar player. And it's like, come on in and just blow out a solo on this thing for me and get it over with. Mainly a guy named Bruce Watson, wonderful guitar player. So that was fun. But drums, bass, everything else was, was me. The thought of even, it wasn't even an option. That's just how it was. And that's pretty much been the way for you the whole time? Yeah. And the main reason that I learned to do that going back to the 80s is as I was joining all those bands, there was nothing but problems with musicians. I know, big shock. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, you have a session, you've booked studio time, you're paying back then a, you know, a whopping 35, 40 bucks an hour to record drums. The guy didn't listen to the demo and shows up and feel like this is pissing me off. So I started going to clubs because I could go anywhere in LA. I spent a month watching drummers and a month watching the bass player and then watching how they locked and watched the guitar player, watched everything and just learned to emulate it. I went, oh, this isn't, you know, once you get it in your head, how the process works. So yeah, I learned to do it out of necessity, especially with the deadlines. Because when they would come in and say, tonight we need at least the basics of a new song. We need you to score a commercial and we have about nine minutes of score that you need to do tonight. So you don't have time to make calls and say, hey, can you come by? It just doesn't exist because you're going to be there for 12, 14 hours just banging this stuff out. But it got your chops up. I mean, it makes you really fast. So that part's good. What inspires you in those situations to come up with new melodic ideas? It just hits me. I have to write a song for this video game, and the creator sent me these lyrics. He said, oh, I'm not sure that you even want to use this. And I just look at it, I hear it, I record it into my iPhone, and uh, then the hard part's building the track around it. But I usually hear the whole thing. I mean, I've had calls um, on commercials and a lot with Cedric where they'd say, well, we're going to need a gospel choir about this. I hear the whole thing right now and just hang up and start recording it. It just, that part's always just come to me. It's a weird channeling thing. I don't know where it comes from. And when it doesn't happen, which happens, then I just pace until it arrives. It's a weird process, but it works. So I'm not going to knock it. That's amazing. Probably all the brain damage from uh, Diet Coke. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, God bless Diet Coke. Yeah. It's super exciting. I was, you know, because inspiration is a hard thing to, to quantify. Yeah. Because people watch videos talking about this kind of stuff. Yeah. And we all want a secret source. We all, we all want some kind of like answer of like, oh, well, if you do this, this, and this, boom, this is what happens. But I could I hasten to guess that it is you playing so many millions and millions of melodies and playing so much piano that all of these ideas are seeping into your head. And you can... They're there. They're and, there. And when I'm scoring the picture, like this little uh, animatic that I'm doing for... Uh, an animatic is when they take the pencil drawings and they kind of put it together with the real dialogue. So it's choppy, but you get an idea of what's going on. But you just learn to look at it. And I can look at it and say, okay, I've got to start it at 152 beats a minute. I'll go to here. Then I'll probably need to drop it like four or five beats to hit this when they blink their eyes and... Just it's just years of experience of doing that stuff. So it just that part just comes in. And then what to do just 
I have to just find the right sound. The idea is here. I hear the final part. I just got to get the right combination of sounds to do that three second part and then move on to the next three second part or whatever. It's fun. It's hard. <laughs> Animation's hard. But it, you're still finding it exciting and interesting oh, to do. Love it. Absolutely love it. Love everything about it. So fun because it's so hard. And these, and certain animation shows, it runs the gamut. Where a show like uh, Dragon Ball Z, I had scored, which I didn't even know became uh, some cult classic till years later. That was just these giant building swells of just noise and air and recordings I would make and tune them way down and just throw them in there. It was a lot of fun doing that. Plus, the technology wasn't there. I mean, I was scoring that in my living room with a 19-inch tube TV, a VHS player, and a Mac, <laughs> and like a Kurzweil sampler. That was it. What year was this? That would have been about 96, 95, 96. So the option to really hit everything wasn't quite there. There wasn't enough technology. And you would presumably have to write them as full pieces and try and write in all the tempo changes, where now, of course, with Pro Tools, we can write individual pieces and then squeeze them all together afterwards. Oh, it's great. <laughs> yeah, it was a very different thing. I think I was using digital, not digital, it was performer mm -hmm. before there was digital audio. I was a monster on it, like, uh, you know, we get on software and could just fly through this stuff and look at it and did these huge swells and never got a single... It's the only show I've ever done where it never got a note. I did the first two years of it. Not once did they say, at this part, could you? It was, it was great. It was great. I could do whatever I want. They just said, it's beautiful. Just keep doing what you're doing. I want to check that show out. Alex, you know that one? Dragon Ball Z. I would say Power Rangers to him is what Dragon Ball Z is. You're Dragon Ball Z. Oh, there you oh, go. You're, uh, I've seen all the my play. childhood like, anime right there. Like, the first one I ever watched from my brother's. I loved that show. I mean, I've seen all the classic seasons. I'm probably not as much as you, though. Oh, okay. Yeah, those builds and that action and that crazy ass anime stuff was just. <laughs> Ron didn't mention his vocal exercises because you're talking about Coke. And I was either Coke or Pepsi. You would gargle. Oh, I had to gargle uh, ice cold Pepsi before doing all those Power Ranger vocals. That was the only way. I had to type my chords so I could sing wrong. And then I would sing for a couple hours all through my throat. And I remember that my vision would go blurry because my sinuses were puffing up and putting pressure on my eyes. And then I'd, it would take like a few hours to go away. Because it's essentially screaming in a way, quietly screaming. And uh, I'm glad I could learn the engineer myself because I don't think I could have ever done it in front of anybody ever. I can imagine, yeah. Yeah, you got to build up that. I'm, I'm very much a studio guy. I'm not a live guy. When I did played live with uh, Fisher, or I was okay in the 80s because it was different. But then later on, it just, I, it just stressed me out more and more and more. And they do weird stuff to you when you're doing bigger shows. I mean, she and I were on Jay Leno. We're at the piano, the scrim's down. My heart's going like... <laughs> So I'm wearing a leather jacket because I'm convinced people are going to see my shirt moving. I'm scared to death. And right, they go, okay, you got about 30 seconds. And the cameraman behind me goes, if you could just move over so I can just get your hands. So he wanted me to play like this. And I just said, if you just move here, you can get a shot of my hands. <laughs> See, all this stuff, and it, it, but it just stresses you out at the last second. Like, we couldn't have discussed this a half hour earlier, yeah. you know. And uh, then you do it, and it's all smooth, and then you're thrilled, and you know as you get closer to the end song, because it's just me, solo, piano, and, I mean, piano and her. That was the big song. So all the, you know, everything you're doing is being watched. And over the years, I just said, I'm just more of a studio guy. I love it. I'm, I'm a rock star when I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> and you always only ever worked on your own. Yeah. Yeah, I have worked only on my own. I mean, we brought in people with the band now and then, but I've really only worked on my own. What about for all the deliverables? Because you've got to output it five different ways at five different yeah. 
You sit there and do all of that yourself? Like we want all the stems. You don't need to break them. Or if you want to break them into categories and uh, you know it needs to sound as close as it can without your master bus compression. Yeah. So we want it delivered and start everything at one hour or start everything at zero. Here's the frame rate. And, and you do all of that yourself? Just yourself. do it. Just do it. Because I've found it would take just as much work to hand it off to somebody and say, here's what they want. There's inevitably going to be a question. Like, oh, should I put these? T- I'm going to put just as much time into it. And I can fly on that stuff. I could, I could fly on that stuff. The only time I was going to have a full team is for the first Power Rangers film. I'd met with 20th Century Fox. They sent me the dailies. I said, we're doing this like the Batman film from the 60s. We're staying true to the real score. And they said, absolutely. We're just essentially doing an hour and a half television show. And I did it. And they loved it. And then uh, the company Saban I was working for took all rights. That's what they did at that time, which is not completely uncommon in this business, unfortunately. And 20th Century Fox uh, said, no, Ron's name goes on as composer. So they Saban yanked me from the project. That was actually the final straw why I left the company. Right. Yeah. And tried to convince me I wasn't good enough for it. I said, it's identical to what I do for the television show. That's what they want. But they had already arranged. They said, you have three weeks to do the score. We'll get you whoever you need, you know, whatever you need. So I was really looking forward to that. (sighs) But everything happens for a reason. Yeah. So I left and things got better. And better and better and better. So no complaints. Incredible. Tell me a little bit more about your setup. So this is your setup. This is where you do everything. This is the setup. How did you get to the eye lounge? I had a big pair of barefoot monitors, and they were beautiful. And then one day I read about these that tune themselves to the room. So you set a microphone where your head would be. You hit a button in the back. It puts out this what, what, what. You know, it's covering all the frequencies. And it tunes itself to all the reflections in the room. And they're loud, and they sound great. And ever since I got them, my mixes are even better. So they're more accurate. A so I heck of a lot cheaper than a pair of Beth. Oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> and I used to have, when I moved here uh, five years ago, I had a giant desk just filled with rack stuff. But rack stuff doesn't really work when you're composing because if they always come back, can you change this slight thing? I didn't want to go through mounds of paperwork to figure out what my setting was on the compression for that bass sound. So I started doing everything in the box and then slowly sold everything off and moved to a desk that I could raise up and down a little bit. And I could I could score anything in the world on this thing. So this is your controller here? Yep. Controller here, this is the native instruments, the 88 key, which as you can see, I don't really use their controls, but it's good for hitting play and stop. And uh, then this stream deck, which is hooked into Pro Tools, which has a million menus, which I've, this is fairly recent. So I'm just learning to dig in and I can do all my editing here if I need to. And then a universal audio arrow where You know, the thing's remarkable for a USB-powered, USB-C-powered thing. Uh, I don't need to use any of the DSP on it. If I do do vocals, I've got a beautiful Millennia down there that I adore. It's cleanest, cleanest signal path for uh, anything I record with a mic. And what mic do you like? Uh, Well, Blue Kiwi. I've kind of been my go-to vocal mic forever. Just I bought it years and years ago, and then I've couple others set up and um and then the mac which has been like the best thing i've bought in a while it's just a monster and use pro tools I know ableton live really well never really got into logic or cubase i've tried i've got nothing against those programs but i was so deeply ingrained into pro tools for so long that Ableton Live, for whatever reason, was just better for using a lot of virtual instruments. But now with a super powerful computer... Now I'm back. You're back. (laughs) It's incredible. And uh, this is still not M1 native, so it's still running in Rosetta. So I can't imagine what it's going to be like uh, when it's it's native, which should be, I think, maybe December. 
And then we'll have a whole new bunch of bugs to work with with that, which they'll work out over time. You know how that goes. I do know how that goes. <laughs> I'm always a little, I'm always, I think for a lot of uh, rock and roll guys, we tend to stay a version or two back. Yeah, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm just a tech whore. If there's an update, I just do it. I'm really bad about that. Great. You're testing it, it all out for like, us. Exactly. Thank you. And then I appreciate I'll, go, it. I'll go on to the boards and say, here's an error. I mean, with Avid, I used to, back when it was DigiDesign, I used to call them and say, here's what I found, here's the workaround, and they were very appreciative. And then as Avid, you know, there's a monster, so there's no one really to talk to there. So now I go look and see what other people write. If I, but I don't really have any problems. It's great. Yeah. Oh, it's so different. To, it, was, it always used to be, you know, just trash your DAE preferences. Oh, yeah, exactly. Yeah, remember that? Tr- five yeah. times a week or something. Yeah, and that guy that made the program so you didn't lose yep. all your settings. You could just do the specific yep. ones. Yeah, those days are all gone. Those days are gone. And, and uh, I had a mountain when, when I, um, just as a point of interest, after Thunderman's ended, I was doing crazy mountain biking and had a horrible accident and crushed my elbow. Um, so within a few weeks, I, cause I've been playing piano forever. I became other than writing, which I've always been awful at, I just became left-handed. So now I do everything left-handed. Are you playing everything left-handed? Yeah, I play mouse is on the left. It's almost odd for me to use the right. I'm just, I'm just made myself left-handed in no time, but it's only cause my brain was so used to doing two things, playing piano that it made it easier to do. But can you still play piano with your right? Yeah, it works. Yeah. And it's funny, for a long time, that's the max spread I could get. Yeah. And then finally, I can go just past an octave. I used to go much farther than an octave, but it's, they said it's a freaking miracle I can even do this. So, I mean, because every ligament, every muscle on both sides Did you tumble off. down? Yeah, I looked at a hill, and I said, I shouldn't do this. But you're going to this. anyway. And I went down, and immediately I remember the right tire caught something. And th- they can't figure out how this got so munched because uh, I gouged the whole left side of my body, hit my helmet on a rock uh, that they said definitely would have killed you if you weren't wearing the helmet. That saved me. And then this was broken. I didn't have a scratch. I just looked over and I went, ah, oh, because this was like this big and my arm was about an inch shorter. I said, <laughs> I said, so I tapped the watch like with my nose, said, call 911. Like, Working on it. Oh, God bless Try you. Try again later. Oh. I had no cell service. Oh. And I was on a trail that I did, I knew where I was, but I'd never been there. And I sure as hell couldn't go up. So I used the bike as a walker and walked for an hour and a half and oh. came to a gated community, the back of it, the fire road. And I'm like, I'm, I'm fucked. <laughs> I mean, I'm going to be standing here forever. And I looked and there was a house there, but I wasn't really good left-handed yet. And I said, well, I think I'm just going to start throwing rocks at the house and break a window and either set an alarm off or if someone's home, they're going to call the police and I got to do this. I'm dehydrated. Mm-hmm. And then in came two cars and I kind of waved them down. It turned out to be two nurses. Oh, it was great. Hallelujah. Yeah. And the rest was uh, a lot of physical therapy and a lot of surgeries. So it's slightly bent, but it all works. I just have to be used to it. It will always be, it'll just always, that's the straightest it'll ever be. You and Les Paul. Yeah. See? Yeah. You know the story? Everybody knows the story. Les Paul, when he broke his arm, they had it set so he could play guitar. Mm-hmm. So his arm was permanently like this. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still one of the greatest guitar players that ever lived. So yeah, you learn to work around it. That's it. I, I it changed how I was playing, and I had to work through it. But I was only working at about twenty percent of my output because I had to play everything left-handed because this was in a cast up to here for a long time. So I would just sit here and just play the parts and be like, well, eh, hopefully this works someday. You know, like ha- life happens. There was that Matt Storm story where he showed up and. About working on the, the soundtrack for the movie. Oh, uh, I forgot that whole story. Oh, yeah. When they did that, uh, when they did that film, which I didn't get, yeah. but they were going to re-record the song, and I said, 
well, surely you're going to let me sing it. And they go, no, we've got the guy from Mr. Big to do it. I went, oh, but that's fine. And they said, and your old friend Matt, uh, Matt Sorum is going to be playing drums on it. I'm like, ah, well, let me know when the session is. And, oh, we forgot to tell you we did it yesterday. And then I think a few years later, I was driving down Sunset Boulevard. There's another store, or it may have been, yeah, it was around that time. And I look over, and there's Matt in this gorgeous Porsche. I'm like, dude, pull over, chatted for a while. He goes, oh, man, I wish I saw you two weeks earlier. We just, we just hired a new guy to do keys with guns. You could have been like the guy. He goes, we've worked together. I just <laughs> went, I could have been in Guns N' Roses. I could have become a big drug addict. I could have <laughs> choked on my own throw up and gone out like a legend. <laughs> For the movie, though, they did use your song. It was just, like you said, re-recorded, but it was your song. And yeah, it's a song that I didn't have rights to that yeah. they re-recorded with somebody yeah. else. It just couldn't be a bigger kick in the balls in the world. And then last I mean, really. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's, I mean, it, it's just really. Yeah. But you did come it's great. We own it. We're not even going to let you watch them record it. We're having somebody else do everything. Like, all right. You know, respect. What, what song was it? <laughs> the theme for the Power, the oh, Go, Go Power, Power Rangers, Rangers, Rangers thing, right. yeah. But it was your original composition, basically, for the movie that you did from the TV series. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. At least they did that yeah. part. But you did come back to Savon, though. Because uh, in space came after the movie. So oh, I was just to- doing stuff for them from yeah. home. They would call in and, yeah. and say, do like you, you guys- want to? And I'm like, eh, why not? Sure. Like you did work together again after the movie. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I was doing Dragon Ball Z at yeah. home after I left. And then Disney called in 2005 for uh, SPD. And that was a blast. So we want to go back to the old sound. And then they wanted to do it the next season. But somebody then decided they wanted it to be rap. So I said, I'm going to do a version, and it's going to suck. And it, it did. And uh, I remember I delivered it to the guy. Uh, Disney was so funny. He's a great guy. He goes, you're right. It sucks. <laughs> 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 so that was it for that. And, uh, uh, yeah, that was a lot of fun, though. That was a lot of fun. But after you left them were you able to renegotiate getting your rights back though not the rights to what they'd already had but from then on did you keep your rights aside at least no that was the deal and you understood it going in we take all your rights and you you're just going to get basically you're paid hourly to sit and write and that goes on in a lot of places right now on major films with um you know a couple of the largest film composers in the business. I mean, if you figure a film takes, a big budget film would take you about four to six months to really get it perfect, and you're doing eight of them a year, right? <laughs> chances are you have other people right? Yeah, doing that work. But so it's common, and it's common in, it, it was common in television, and it's common now with, music libraries they do that kind of stuff they have just the stable of people doing the work they pay up they buy them out things are getting worse actually and um i'm glad i don't have to do that part they got me in the it got me in the business yeah uh, that's the unfortunate reality isn't it it is and because the only other option is i've told composers over the years because they'll call and how do i get in the business what can i do to get in i said uh and they'll play stuff, and if it's great, I'll go like, wow, you, your stuff is really great. Like, should I get an agent? I'm like, no, nah, agent. They're not going to call on your behalf. Nothing's going to happen. I said, here's what you write. Write, because I don't need anybody. Write to composers or productions. Have to be very specific on the style you want to go into. So don't be contacting a gaming company if you want to score films. And just write, available 24-7, I'm your I make great coffee. I said, I guarantee you, you'll get called back by somebody looking because that's all they want. And then if you're brilliant, after a few years, you'll start getting work. And only one guy took my advice and he ended up working with Hans Zimmer. He literally knocked on the door and said, I make coffee. And they said, come on in. <laughs> yeah. No, it's, it's, that's a really powerful thing you just said. It's a rite of passage. It's a rite of passage. You have to do it. There's nobody, unless you're just connected or some fluke happens, like winning the lotto. Um, 
everybody expects it. We got here from suffering a lot. Trust me. And we're not letting anybody just walk in. And they have to make great coffee. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Well, I'm sure we can have some links down below to maybe other stuff that you've done on the subject. Yeah. Yeah, we'll come up with stuff. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was amazing. Thank you, everybody. Please have any comments and questions below and have a marvelous time recording, producing, composing. And we'll speak to you all again soon. Thanks. So long, farewell. Have a au revoir. Adios. See ya. Ciao. Goodbye. Later. (laughs) Ha, 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 ha.